Hello and welcome to the ZSL Wild Science Podcast. I'm Ellie Darby, the Science Communications and Events Manager here at the Zoological Society of London's Institute of Zoology. And today we're going to be learning about nature-based solutions and how they can be used to tackle climate change and global biodiversity loss together. A landmark study published recently in the Journal of Applied Ecology, led by ZSL climate and biodiversity experts, states that treating the global climate change and biodiversity crises separately is, in many situations, ineffectual and, at worst, exacerbating the problem. This article calls for this combined approach to be integrated into global science policy agendas. While the overwhelming scientific consensus is that humanity is facing a climate crisis, biodiversity is also declining across the world at unprecedented rates. A loss that erodes the very foundations of economies, livelihoods, food security, health and quality of life worldwide. The question is, how do we create and implement solutions to both these crises at once? Thankfully, I have world-leading experts and authors of this new publication joining me in the episode who are hopefully going to be able to answer this and help me untangle the complex and diverse issue of nature-based solutions. Now, this all feels rather overwhelming for me, but luckily I'm not in it alone, as I'm joined today by Dr. Natalie Petarelli, a senior research fellow here at ZSL's Institute of Zoology. Natalie will be co-hosting today's episode and guiding me through the convoluted web of science and policy, which luckily for us, she's an expert in. So Natalie, some listeners may remember that you've joined us before on a previous podcast episode, number 28, all about rewilding. So we know that's a big part of your work. But just remind me, what's your main research focus at ZSL? I am a climate change ecologist. So I look at both how climate change impacts a species and ecosystem, but also look at ways to find solutions to mitigate or adapt to the climate change crisis or to reduce the loss of species and ecosystems. Okay, so as you say, you work a lot on studying climate change and its impacts on biodiversity. And it seems like you can't turn on the news or scroll through Twitter these days without seeing climate change being discussed at all levels. Can you explain why this is so important right now? Well, because finally, people are starting to see the reality of climate change. So climate change has been discussed for nearly over 20 years now. But for many and for a long time, it was sort of some science fiction where suddenly the sea was rising and there was drought and there was fire. People didn't really believe that this was all true. They didn't even believe that humans were the primary cause of climate change. Now, 20 years you know, after uh, the Rio Convention, etc., we are absolutely sure that human is changing the climate. And we are starting to see the impact of climate change on everyday life. Big fires, big drought, big heat waves are starting to hit human population. What we are seeing is people realizing that all the stories and all the science that they heard is actually true. It's becoming reality. And what about the biodiversity crisis? What is this and how does it link to the climate change crisis? So the biodiversity crisis refers to the fact that we are losing species and population of species in ecosystem at an incredibly fast rate. And that is caused by many things, land use change. So, for example, deforestation, also linked to pollution and to invasive species. Um, So the release of species that are not native to ecosystem and that suddenly invade whole ecosystem and whole landscapes. But it's also linked to climate change, as of climate change having an impact on the distribution and the extinction risk of species and ecosystem. And the way climate change impacts biodiversity is uh, multidimensional. So it can be a very direct effect as of uh, species suddenly finding themselves outside their ecological tolerance, so the type of habitats and conditions that they are used to and that they thrive in, and uh, unable to move because of a lack of connectivity or because they are plants. It might be uh, something that has to do with species species on the move, whereby species are moving because of climate change to track their preferred ecological condition, and they may therefore arrive in new area, in new ecosystem, where they hadn't been before, and then can, that can have an impact. So climate change can impact the biodiversity crisis, which is one type of link between those two crises. Yes. Yeah, so as you say, climate change can affect biodiversity loss as these species struggle to adapt to rapidly changing conditions. But is there an example of how biodiversity loss 
relates to the climate change crisis. Climate change can impact biodiversity loss, but biodiversity loss is actually deepening the climate change crisis uh, through different mechanisms. So first of all, well, nature is really good at sequestering and uh, storing carbon. And when you put forest on fire and you deforest and you remove mangrove, what you're actually doing is one, completely reducing carbon storage capacity on Earth, but also removing those organisms that are sequestering carbon. So removing carbon out of the atmosphere. And by burning them, you're actually releasing carbon. So you're increasing the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. But there's also some indirect pathway. So imagine communities living in area that are more hit by drought and heat wave or lack of precipitation. These community might need to deforest more, create more uh, fields of agriculture to actually produce enough food uh, for their livelihood and survival. So climate change can actually impact other drivers of biodiversity loss, such as land use change. So it sounds incredibly complicated the way these factors interact. And how are these two crises currently being addressed in global policy? I know there are a lot of acronyms in this world of policy frameworks, and to me, they're confusing. So let's introduce them slowly, perhaps starting with the UNFCCC and the CBD. So the UNFCCC stands for the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And uh, people might be more aware of this convention because its conference of the parties, so the big meeting of that convention, is happening in Glasgow at the end of October. And so that's a meeting where uh, all the nation comes together to discuss international coordination to tackle the climate change crisis. Uh, the other convention to know about is the CBD, which stands for Convention on Biological Diversity. Again, this is a United Nations convention that brings together all uh, the countries that want to coordinate to tackle the biodiversity crisis. And those two conventions are informed by two independent uh, scientific panels that are quite famous. One is the IPCC, the International Panel for Climate Change, uh, which uh, gives the science uh, needed to inform decision at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC. The other one is the IPBES, the International Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, also an independent scientific platform that provides evidence this time to the Convention on Biological Diversity, CBD. Okay, I think I got that. But so so these two, you know, climate change and biodiversity are currently being addressed separately. So why is it important to tackle these two global challenges together? Well, just because those two crises, as we have just been discussing, are, are highly intertwined. And in particular, solution to both crises can be the same. There has been more and more push for decision around nature-based solution, which are solutions that capitalize on nature to uh, address social challenges such as climate change. Uh, now, the good thing with nature-based solutions is that in theory, and because they are nature-based and because they, are, uh, they can be used to tackle climate change, you should be able to use them to both address the climate change and the biodiversity crisis. However, if badly implemented or badly informed, it might address one or the other or none of them very well. The important thing here is to create an entity and not just a scientific entity, but also a, a policy entity and, and a funding entity that really help to bring all this knowledge on climate change and biodiversity together to make sure that whatever solution we might uh, consider to tackle the climate change and biodiversity crisis are well informed and are, are not inefficient. So can you talk us through an example of a nature-based solution? Well, there's a lot of different type of uh, nature-based solution, but two that uh, many people are talking about right now are uh, restoring ecosystems such as mangroves. Mangroves are really good at sequestering and capturing carbon and at the same time at protecting people from uh, extreme natural events and the setting up of protected area. And that's because a lot of those ecosystems, as they mature, they get even better at capturing and storing the carbon. So when you protect them, you gain a lot of years as opposed to destroying them and try to rebuild them again. So what can habitat restoration add to the protection of an area? So it's important to realize that those are different solutions. Protection of an area is about primarily protecting carbon stock 
all those forests around the world, they are already storing carbon. If you deforest them, if you remove them, you're removing a lot of those carbon stock that are then released in the atmosphere. So this is about not putting more greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. And that's why we're talking about protection. It's also uh, important to think about protection because trees take a long time to become super efficient sequestering CO2 machine. Therefore, you want to protect those trees that are already there and doing it really well. Well, uh, restoration is really about increasing those carbon storage capacity and those carbon sequestration capacity, either through forests and mangroves, but also seagrass and kelp and corals. So anything that actually helps remove carbon from the atmosphere and store it into the ground. And nature is pretty good at doing that. So the idea here is to uh, bring them back. And so they have been degraded or, or literally completely removed from many places, while actually they can help us tackle climate change, both in, ter in terms of uh, mitigation, so removing carbon from the atmosphere and storing it, but also in, in uh, the sense of adaptation. So think about mangrove and how they provide coastal protection during hurricanes. That sounds like an excellent solution. So what are the issues faced when trying to restore an ecosystem or habitat? So the first thing to say is that restoration is really hard. There's a, a lot of things that need to be done the right way. And if you go too quickly or if you don't really really use the latest evidence on how to do it best, it can crash quite badly. That can lead to a lot of uh, money being wasted. The second step is that it, uh, you don't systematically tackle the climate change crisis quickly and a lot with restoration, because sometimes you need restoration from the point of view of restoring biodiversity as, as opposed to uh, maximizing carbon sequestration and uh, carbon storage. But in many situations, those nature-based solutions can be really useful to tackle both crises. Why are they not used more commonly? I would say the, the primary uh, reason is the lack of funding. So a lot of government have pledged money toward biodiversity conservation, but it is so far off from what the amount of money that we need to properly restore ecosystem across the world. Alongside habitat restoration, protected areas can have a huge impact on the conservation of an ecosystem and its biodiversity. So far, we've heard some examples of nature-based solutions that involve protected areas in land and freshwater systems. But joining us now to dive into the world of marine protected areas is Professor Heather Coldaway, a senior technical advisor in ZSL's conservation and policy department. So tell me, what does your work involve at ZSL? So my ro role is looking at the interface between science and conservation and really trying to find solutions um, in the marine environment to protect and restore it. Why are protected areas needed in the first place? Why are they useful? Full. So a big part of the, the conservation toolbox for the ocean is, is around marine protected areas. And protected areas are a really important part of that comprehensive approach to how we save our planet. We need to have places that are particularly important for species and habitats and creating entire ecosystems that we look after, we leave alone, we allow to recover and regenerate. And then that allows other areas outside of those to re restore. So obviously, if we're thinking about this in the context of the ocean, the fish don't know where the boundaries of the protected area are. They're swimming in and out. And if they're protected inside it, they breathe, they recover, and then they spread out from there. So that benefits uh, the wider ocean. And it also can benefit people through providing additional fish numbers and, and things that people depend on for their food and livelihoods. And are protected areas still effective as discrete zones or is connectivity important too? So when you're setting up a protected area, and I'll focus on marine protected areas because that's where I have most knowledge, there's lots of different reasons that you can be doing that. It can be to protect a particular species that you're really concerned about, a breeding area for that, particularly important habitats like seagrasses, mangroves or coral reefs. Obviously, as a standalone area, it's still important in its own right. It's actually protecting that particular habitat. But because of the flow, whether that's through larvae from fish or corals spreading out beyond that area, Area, the way that migratory species like sharks or tunas, sea turtles and seabirds move between areas, then how they connect to different parts of the ocean is really important to look at how we protect in the ocean as a whole.
whole. So at the moment, what we're looking at is global commitments to protect 10% of the ocean, scientific consensus and increasing political recognition, we need to protect 30% of the ocean. But we need to look at 100% of the ocean. And we also need to look at how that connects to land. So Heather, in the terrestrial world, we have now some good example of protected area that have demonstrated both an effect in terms of uh, preserving biodiversity, but also lessening the impact of climate change. For example, there's been some recent work in South America showing how protected area have uh, reduced deforestation and protected species at the same time. Uh, do we have the same type of example in the marine world? Absolutely. And I think we have for some time been looking at things separately. We look at climate change as one issue. We look at ocean conservation as another. And we look at what's happening on land quite differently. And obviously, it is just one planet. And there's nothing more <laughs> indicative than showing the fact that climate change is both a global impact, but also that protected areas can be a big part of that solution. So while we can see that marine protected areas are not immune from the impacts of climate change, so we see things like coral reefs being affected by by rising sea surface temperatures causing bleaching, which can kill reefs, we see in protected areas where they've got a lot less pressure on them that they recover quicker and faster. We see particularly important habitats like mangroves, which trap carbon and, and more so than tropical forests, but obviously avoiding those being cut down by having them well protected is going to be a really important part of climate mitigation. And then we're understanding whole new areas of work around the ocean that we didn't appreciate perhaps on carbon storage. And that might be what's trapped in deep sea sediments and the role that that's playing. So basically, the fish in the sea and everything, they're carbon, right? You know, when we're looking at it and how we protect it, how we increase the abundance and diversity of species, which is exactly what happens through protected areas, then we're helping to trap and store carbon. So if they're that amazing at all those things, what's stopping everywhere being protected? What are some of the challenges faced when implementing protected areas, particularly in the marine environment? The issues around protected areas, of course, are that people live on the planet and then there's a conflict in use. So protecting the entire planet 100% uh, will be really challenging to achieve through the fact that people have needs, that we farm, that we need to provide food, that we fish and so on. And the areas of conflict that we see is around those ongoing activities. So fish remain the major source of wild protein that we still get. And there's huge demands on the ocean and billions of people who are actually depending on the ocean for their food and livelihoods. So the areas that we're trying to address through protected areas is finding those solutions. And that can be a combination of remote, the last sort of wilderness areas in the ocean, which can be vast areas where we're looking at fully protecting those as really large ecosystems. And then in coastal areas where you look at a locally managed marine protected areas, where the communities are driving the process of where to protect, how to protect, and seeing that as part of the management of their coastal environment. So that's combination of looking at how we protect and restore the ocean, how we respond to people's needs means that you've got this portfolio of solutions available. I think another really key thing that's quite different in the ocean is over half of it is areas beyond national jurisdiction. So these are outside of where countries have that political control, they have that management control. And that at the moment is pretty much a free for all. We currently don't have the mechanisms to protect it. And that is a really big problem. So all of the negotiations that are happening at a policy level to address that are fundamental in terms of how we go about protecting half of the ocean. We're also seeing challenges of, of international fishing fleets who are fishing beyond orders and beyond boundaries. So there's um, more challenges there. If you have a protected area um, that you know is the size of France, use that example for Natalie, <laughs> how do you go about patrolling that? And what we're seeing is the combination of using vessels, but also also now increasingly satellite technology to deal with management and enforcement. So these are all advances that we're making. Similarly, in the community areas that I've worked with, such as ZSL's work in the Philippines and, and in Mozambique with local partners and local communities, is around how you're building that management and enforcement at a local level. And that's when we really see these marine protected areas being really effective. And that's recovering fish that benefit both the biodiversity and wildlife, recovering habitats. So you're seeing that the diversity in these protected areas is much higher, as is the biomass, so the sheer numbers of animals and plants and, and, and other creatures in those environments. 
I mean, just to add to this, I think that's an important point, realizing that it's not removing people that get you maximum biodiversity. Biodiversity is best retained for the moment in terrestrial environment on indigenous lands. It is key to work with local community. That, that's where we get success. Protected areas buy us time. These are important special places. They're one part of the solution, but we need a whole heap of others to actually deliver what we need to do. And, and those are very well outlined in both the scientific literature and the sustainable development goals that nations have, around the world have signed up to. So I think from what you've said, uh, Heather, it's uh, fair to say that uh, all marine protected area count as nature-based solution, right? But that some marine ecosystem are actually super good at, at capturing carbon, storing carbon, maybe more so than others. Is that is that correct? You're absolutely right, Natalie, in terms of where they are, how big they are, what diversity that they're capturing. So if we're talking about things like kelp forests, seagrasses and mangroves. These are all really fundamental in terms of carbon sequestration. And some of the challenges that we are seeing though is that, you know, lots of well-wishing recovery and restoration projects for mangroves that might just plant one kind of mangrove, perhaps in the wrong place, even on seagrass beds, which we see a lot in the Philippines, which is causing further challenges. And that's not retaining the full functionality or the full biodiversity. So all of the species that go with a rich and diverse mangrove forest compared to something like a monoculture plantation like we see in some forestry. So yes, that still traps carbon, but you know what we're looking at is nature-based solutions and how we protect and restore habitats that are delivering that full complement of climate mitigation and biodiversity conservation. So those two go absolutely hand in hand. The other challenge with spatial protection is obviously, as we see with climate change, we're seeing lots of movement of species distributions and change. So we're starting now to look much more at marine protected area networks, about working across borders and boundaries and how countries can complement each other through spatial planning to actually look at how species are going to move over time and to anticipate that and then to ensure that that still enables those species at key areas, particularly of, of life stages, to be protected. And so it's important also to say that it's not just about carbon, right? It's carbon mitigation and carbon adaptation. And some of those marine protected area, marine ecosystems do an incredible job at actually helping people tackle the climate crisis. Is that right? Yes, that's a really vital point. And, and to, I guess, stick with the mangrove example, because that's been a real area of ZSL's expertise both from a science and conservation perspective. As we're seeing in the Philippines, increasing frequencies of and severity of storms and, and where you had intact, diverse natural mangrove forests, they really did a phenomenal job at protecting the coastlines, protecting people, protecting houses and land from being washed away compared to sites where unfortunately those forests have been cut down. So those knock-on effects and, and enabling us to adapt, which is why looking at restoration Storing coastal green belts and having those protected is really important part of the, the climate adaptation strategy and ensuring that also those mangroves have somewhere to move as climate changes and, and sea level rises. It's a very dynamic process. And unfortunately, us with our sort of preference for concrete and for boxing everything in and setting boundaries on everything doesn't necessarily respond well to the dynamic situation in nature and how things are changing as a result of climate change. So you can see already since those marine protected areas have been set up, their sort of success. At the present, there's about sort of 3% of the ocean is in well-managed protected areas. So you see we're falling well short of targets, but the science consensus is very strong and building all the time. So there is really significant evidence that marine protected areas do a great job in terms of protecting biodiversity, restoring biodiversity, and also an increasing body of evidence about their role to mitigate climate change and to store carbon and build in the adaptation that we were just talking about. In the in the world, what do you think is the future in terms of how do we progress the nature-based agenda in the marine world? I think what's been encouraging for me over the last decade or so is seeing that the ocean is increasingly getting attention in the media. We have this challenge of, of seeing us and then nature and nature is land and then there's the ocean and fish are food, not wildlife. And so sort of shifting the perceptions and the understanding that everything's connected and we're part of nature and 
and perhaps the experience that we've had during the pandemic and the fact that people have started to value nature more is is really important. The ocean is more challenging because, you know, you look at the surface and you have no concept of everything that's going on underneath. But I think the attention around plastic pollution has been one where we've really seen people connecting their behaviour and what they do with what the impact is on the ocean and, and, and on the world. In terms of what we need to do, on one hand, for me, I don't understand why <laughs> when nations of the world spend years coming up with these agreements and they they miss targets by 10 years or more, countries of the world said they would protect 10% of the ocean by 2020 and didn't even make half of that. You know, we, we need to hold governments to account. We need to make sure that nature and the sustainability of our entire planet is front and, and central of agendas, not seen as coming 45th on a list of what's politically important and what's a vote winning topic. It, it has to be fundamental. And I think as we find those solutions and see the evidence around marine protected areas, finding ways to do those more and better is a case of scaling up. And obviously, time is not on our side. And that's the big challenge. So it is a case of the science community being very open and increasing access, building capacity and having more equitable capacity. So at the moment, climate change impacts are not equal. The countries that are emitting greenhouse gases are not equal. And yet the solutions need to be resolved globally. So it is a case of really trying to pull those solutions together and to uh, support countries where they have those capacities gaps and build a more equitable society that can tackle this together. Now we've heard about nature-based solutions in various land, freshwater and marine environments, so why aren't they more prevalent? In your new publication, Natalie, you've identified that part of the difficulty in developing these integrated biodiversity and climate solutions is due to a lack of information in five areas of applied ecology. How can they be improved to help nature-based solutions move forward? So yes, we try to identify broad area where we think that there's a need for more climate change biodiversity type of research. So the first one is on the biodiversity benefits associated with the deployment of a nature-based uh, solution. So for the moment, the assumption is that a nature-based solution will benefit biodiversity. But our understanding of the short-term and long-term biodiversity benefit and this benefit associated with those nature-based solutions is actually quite limited. And that might be due, among other things, to a lack of framework on really measuring those biodiversity benefits associated with the nature-based uh, solution. The second one is our ecosystem monitoring. So we know, and we, we, we just were chatting about this before, that climate change does uh, make species move. Uh, so species have to track climatic conditions to survive. While ecosystems have to do the same, as of uh, some ecosystems cannot uh, thrive anymore because the climatic conditions have completely changed. We, we are not very good at tracking and predicting ecosystem on the move. The third problem we identified has to do with uh, nature-based solution Effectiveness. We are not very good at predicting how a specific project might be affected in terms, for example, of uh, carbon storage or carbon sequestration as the climatic conditions are changing. And in some, some situations, it may literally jeopardize the effectiveness of those solutions. Another issue has to do with scale. What's a bit worrying is that more and more we are seeing the, the, the enormous scope uh, of the climate change crisis. And we tend to tackle it with very small, small scale projects, small restoration projects. We don't really do gigantic restoration projects. And so there's a bit of a disjoint between the proliferation of local action and the larger scale response that is needed to those big huge global crisis. And finally, one area that we identified has to do with risk assessment. So whenever you deploy a nature-based solution, there, there might be some risk associated with it, which have never really been highlighted and presented in a comprehensive and systematic manner. More what we see in the literature is a mention of ad hoc stories. So here, what would be really useful when you're trying to engage local community to potentially implement a nature-based solution is to be clear on what are the risks uh, as well as the benefits. So, so presenting a, a fair, transparent image as you're trying to engage people with those nature-based solutions. 
And to find out more about how to assess the benefits and risks of nature-based solutions, we will be asking Professor William Sutherland, the Miriam Rothschild Professor in Conservation Biology at the University of Cambridge. So Bill, I'm really happy to have you here today. I think it would be nice to um, introduce a bit what you do, because I know some people might know you more in terms of your work on uh, the impact of environmental change, uh, specifically on birds, but you're also interested in uh, policy and decision making. Is that right? So can you tell us a bit about what your work involves now? So the current work is, uh, I guess, sort of five things. Uh, One of them is horizon scanning, trying to determine the issues that might arise so we're better prepared. We're interested in setting research agendas, asking policymakers what questions they most want answered. The third is collating evidence together in an efficient way so that users can look up evidence almost immediately. It's widely available. Uh, And then next, it is trying to embed evidence into policy and practice in a whole range of different ways. And then finally, we're interested in how you use experts. So the two worst ways of using experts are to have an expert tell you what to do or have a panel of experts in a room. Uh, And we're interested in ways of improving that. So it looks like you're not that busy nowadays. (laughs) Absolutely. Twiddling my thumbs. So why the shift to the sort of policy and decision making side? Did you just discover everything there was to know about birds or did you want to be more involved in the practical side of conservation? So I, I started off as a standard academic doing work that I find really intellectually satisfying. So we we studied the behavior and we tried to work out the population dynamics from studying the behavior using game theory. And then we then use that to try to answer applied questions such as habitat loss, climate change, GM crops, those sorts of things. And I used to do conservation in my spare time. I was involved in restoring habitats and practical conservation. And uh, and I did more and more of that conservation. And then I decided that I saw serious problems in some areas. And I thought it might be interesting to start exploring ideas to fill in those gaps. And it turned out that what we did, people seemed to find useful. So I, I rather surprisingly shifted direction from the sort of standard ecological side, which is what I imagine I'd be doing all my life, to this much more policy and practice area. So as Natalie mentioned, one of the areas of applied ecology that's been identified as preventing or slowing the development of these nature-based solutions that we're discussing today is the lack of a comprehensive framework to assess the risks of implementing the solutions. What does this actually mean, a comprehensive framework, and, and why is it needed? There's a whole set of different problems. There's problems of water quality, water quantity, air pollution, finding means of generating food, biodiversity decline, and nature can help solve, to some extent, many of those. And, and often they're sort of incompatible, or you've got to work out where, where to do those. And you really need a general strategy to say, what are the sensible actions to carry out where? And in terms of the risks, there's some actions that might seem a sensible thing to do. So everyone knows that it's good to plant trees in towns, and it usually is good to plant trees in towns. But if you have uh, very high buildings on each side uh, with a lot of cars going underneath and you create a canopy on the top, you're basically sort of putting a box, a lid on top of a canyon of buildings and increasing the air pollution. Uh, So you've got to think about where it would work and where it wouldn't. One other example is in a water catchment. If you delay the flow low down the water catchment, so you plant trees or you restore the peat bog, what you actually do, you delay the water so it hits at the same time as water from higher up the catchment. And that might actually mean that there's greater flooding problems. So there are these sorts of subtleties that we really need to think through. We really need to think through what we do where, what's going to be beneficial and what might be detrimental. And we really need to think of precisely what actions to carry out because there's lots of work showing the details really matter. Well, how do you know whether something is risky? How do you get that information? Well, quite a lot of that is the documented studies and not looking at the collated evidence. That is the riskiest thing to do. And doing things that we know aren't beneficial can be risky. And also just sort of thinking it through. Is this likely to work? How is this likely to work? So what are some of the risks of nature-based solutions? 
The major one is to be doing things that are ineffective and just wasting money, but also doing things in the wrong place. So working out which peat bogs are likely to be most efficient, particularly in the face of climate change, where they're likely to have benefits, where is it practical, what are the social and economic consequences of doing a particular peat bog. So thinking all of that through is really critical. And if you don't do that, it's quite likely to be damaging. So once you've thought these risks through, how do you quantify them? Can you measure them? Is some things more risky than others? It's a question of starting off by looking at the collated evidence and saying, what are the possible side consequences? And then also putting together expert opinion and local knowledge and trying to work out what's important, working out what we know about the hydrology, what we know about the requirements of particular species, what the climate change consequences might be in a particular area. You can put all of that together and say, is this likely to work? Is this likely to be a waste of time? Or is it likely to do something that's detrimental to something else? Are benefits ever included in this this framework? Uh, Absolutely. It's looking at benefits and costs and risks and people's values. You know, so how feasible is a particular action? Trying to work out what you're trying to achieve and what's the most cost-effective way of achieving that with minimum risk. And so if you were to talk to scientists, either, you know, the modelers or the field workers, how could they help advance the the science of nature-based solution? What could they do that would be particularly useful with advancing that framework risk? Imagine that framework and think what it would look like. And then think about what we don't know. So what do we don't know in terms of modeling, the consequence of different actions, and particularly how do we improve our ways of doing things? What are the better ways of restoring peat bogs, increasing the water quality? Innovating and thinking of new ideas is absolutely critical. Yeah, that's that's great. And Natalie, do you have any additional comments on things that the scientific community could do to contribute to this framework, but also any of the five areas of applied ecology that we mentioned earlier that need improving in order to move nature-based solutions forward? I think if people are interested in nature-based solution, the, those five areas, and there might be others, but we identify those five in particular because we thought that they particularly sit at that interface between biodiversity conservation and tackling the climate change crisis. Those five areas actually are underpinned by a lot of different questions. And hopefully people can see the value of what they do or start to develop new ideas around those big areas. And as long as um, there's some communication going on, having the right resources for that chain that goes from science to actually uh, developing so- uh, solutions or looking at whether they work or not and making them sustainable in the long term. One trick we often do is we have- Ask policymakers and practitioners, what are the questions that, if answered, would make most difference to them? And if we could then say, for this agenda that Natalie's laid out, what would most usefully fill those gaps and allow us to achieve that agenda? And the advantage of that is if policy and practitioners say, this is what we want to know, then if you're thinking of writing a grant, you think, well, if I if I write a grant in that area or answer that question, then it's more likely to get funded. It's more likely to get published somewhere prestigious. I'm more likely to do something good for the world. So it's a win-win. Win, win, win. And Bill, you've created a, a resource, I believe, called Conservation Evidence. Can you tell me a bit more about this and who it's for and how they can find it? Uh, conservationevidence.com. The idea is to collate evidence on an industrial scale and make it available to practitioners. So a team of us have read one and a half million paper titles in 17 different languages and pulled that out to provide reviews of over 3,000 different conservation actions. And the idea is that you can then just look up the answers or the evidence for conservation issues. So in your opinion, what would be the next step for tackling the climate change and the biodiversity crisis in unison? I think, as you said, we need a combined plan that is evidence-based. So we need a plan that delivers the complicated combined issues that we want delivered. And then we need that embedded in policy and practice. So they're right from the top. This is something that is done. And then that feeds down to statutory bodies and local authorities and you know, right across right across government, right across society.
So we've understood the need for addressing the climate change and biodiversity crises together. And we found out about how nature-based solutions could do this and what's needed to improve them at this stage. But what's next? To actually get these types of strategies being implemented, we need to create a framework which can help integrate nature-based solutions into global policy. I personally find policy and the different conventions and governing bodies really confusing. So I'm hoping our next guest will be able to guide me and any of the listeners with me on this through some of the policy aspects of nature-based solutions. We're joined now by Matthew Loughton, a policy officer in the Conservation and Policy Department here at ZSL. Just to start us off, what does your job actually involve at ZSL? Uh, It's a good question. Uh, It covers a lot of bases, um, I would say, just because of the wide range of issues which um, ZSL engages with. And a lot of those issues sit outside my personal area of expertise. So on a daily basis, I would say I would maybe receive requests for sign-on from the organisation to different ministers within the UK government or receive requests for input into calls for evidence and consultation responses from DEFRA or DFID, um, as well as sort of co- collating cross-society opinions on certain issues. Um, and then also through the generation of different position statements from ZSL, be that on trophy hunting or on sort of more very specific issues like the Amazon fires a few years ago. Um, and then I also represent ZSL where I can on uh, intergovernmental uh, uh, meetings, be that site or sit on working groups for for the UK government to do with issues around the Convention for Biological Diversity or CMS, um, among other different sort of policy, environmental policy areas. So you mentioned there one of the UN conventions. Can we just go through what are the different UN conventions that relate to biodiversity conservation? The central one, I guess, would be the, the CBD, the Convention for Biological Diversity, under which a set of targets have been set for governments around the world who are parties to that convention, essentially obligated to commit to fulfilling those targets. However, no government has really adequately reached any of those targets over the past two decades. Um, they were supposed to be reset last year, obviously, because of COVID that got postponed. And so there's been a lot of discussions around the resetting of these targets, uh, what they look like and, and how they're monitored and, and what kind of indices are going to be used to evaluate the implementation of different government efforts. Then there's lots of other conventions that feed into, you know, biodiversity, again, is such a broad term in many ways. So stuff like CITES, so the Convention for Trade in Endangered Species and the CMS, the Convention for Migratory Species, um, as well as a, a host of other high level UN sort of UN General Assembly and even um, the CCPCJ, so the Commission for Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice, all of these arenas either directly relate to biodiversity or have resolutions or declarations within them which speak directly to conservation and biodiversity. So Matt, is it true also that more and more biodiversity is being mentioned at the UN framework on climate change? That convention that originally had very little to do with biodiversity. You're right, and I I should have mentioned that. I kind of neglected to do so because, as you say, it's been historically centred around kind of climate change as a standalone thing. And it's becoming ever more apparent, at at least across the kind of political spheres and governments, that, you know, there's an inherent intrinsic link between the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis. And they both uh, impact each other. And the UNFCCC is finally taking more notice of biodiversity loss as a, a central issue that needs to be addressed and, and then one thing that I think a lot of people do not systematically realize is where the information that those conventions use to make decisions come from. They all have their own little scientific committee. Indeed, there's different scientific bodies that feed in the, the evidence base uh, from which these kind of goals and targets are set. The inherent problems of that are that if they're not speaking to one another, then you have sort of divergent targets which should be under one banner. Yeah, so for example, uh, each convention has their own scientific committee. Then you have those big platform like the IPBES or the IPCC, those are international panel uh, of scientists. And then you have something like the IUCN, isn't it, Matt? Yes, indeed. And I think what you pointed out far more um, concisely than I ever would is just how many different layers there are and how many different platforms there are that feed into these processes. Hence my confusion. <laughs> and mine. I swim in a sea of acronyms on a daily basis. So these different conventions, do they have the same power and is there equal funding for them? No, you raise a, a good point. The the amount of money that's made available annually for climate 
change mitigation vastly outweighs that of biodiversity and conservation uh, action. I think there's still a lot of calls and there's still a lot of recognition that the amount of money that's been made available for climate change mitigation is still not enough. And the, the, the gap between that and what is being made available for biodiversity is quite shocking. So Matt, we, we have been talking a lot in this podcast about nature-based solution, right? So those solutions that uh, harness nature to really help us get out of societal challenges such as climate change. But when it comes to all those conventions, who is in charge when it comes to nature-based solution well, i think that's the that's the issue there's no nobody in charge of nature based solution and and it's um viewed as this golden bullet which it p- perfectly could be but there is no single body there's no single unified monitoring framework there's nothing currently available that ensures that there is a unified approach to nature-based solutions because uh, nature-based solutions could provide an approach which would integrate climate and biodiversity uh, mitigation activities as long as those nature-based solutions can also provide benefits to biodiversity. Now, at the moment, as we've just discussed, there's nobody overseeing what nature-based solutions are, how they're implemented, and what benefits that gives to biodiversity. And that can, I'm guessing, create a problem when some conventions are way more powerful than others, and when you're trying to get solutions that deliver on multiple fronts. Exactly. So, you know, under the UNFCCC, at the moment, you could have nature-based solutions front and centre within commitments that governments sign up to, and those nature-based solutions could be implemented in a way which provide quite significant uh, climate crisis mitigation within the countries which they implemented, but that could be done to the cost of local biodiversity. So why is it important that nature-based solutions and this combined approach are being talked about now? Why is this a good time? Um, it's a good time now. It would have been a good time 10 years ago. I mean, if you look at the IPCC report, some of the the, the, the impacts of, those, the, of, of climate change are already irreversible. And you're looking at sort of the global biodiversity, GBO5 and the IPES report, and they're talking about the sort of catastrophic losses in biodiversity and the severe ramifications that's going to have for human health and welfare, let alone the species and ecosystems themselves. Now is a good time um, because of all of that. Now is a good time because it is COP26. It's in the UK. Uh, we are a, a UK institution with global reach. If we don't start to address the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis in the same breadth, in the same way, in the same importance levels, um, you know, we, we're already running out of time to do a lot, but there is still time. If you can get to a place where nature-based solutions are being used to combat the climate crisis and they are simultaneously are providing benefit to biodiversity locally, regionally, uh, nationally, wherever they're being implemented, you can start to see a reverse in biodiversity loss. You can start to see the ability of of, of human-dominated landscapes and and other areas of, of improved climate change resilience. And providing that combined approach has never been more essential than now. And as a policy officer who has been in the business for a while, what would you like to see changing? A real financial commitment to, to combat the biodiversity crisis in line with climate, the amount of money that's spent on climate change mitigation and the climate crisis. You know, they are issues that have that run in parallel. They are equally devastating. They're going to have they fundamentally interlinked. So they sh- there should be a unified way in which these are dealt with. And to, to do that, there needs to be equitable financing for activities under the CBD and under the UFCCC. We can talk about whether there should be one universal body for this instead of these two separate ways. But coming out of COP26, coming out of COP15, equitable money made globally for biodiversity conservation. Um, there needs to be a stop on the sort of harmful subsidies that go on all around the world for agriculture agriculture and fishing. And we also need to have a global mechanism where there is a unified approach to how nature-based solutions are implemented and also a monitoring mechanism and of of the the benefits to biodiversity that those nature-based solutions are providing. Um, And that the nature-based solutions front needs to be governed by a single body that has oversight of what nature-based solutions can provide and how they're implemented. And however that works is fed in through these two conventions. 
So Natalie, we've asked everyone on the episode today about the future, the next steps for integrating the science policy agendas for climate change and biodiversity. But we haven't heard from you on this yet. So what do you want to see happening next? I really want to see four steps implemented. The first one is that I would like to see investment being raised in biodiversity to match investment in climate change. Second, I would like to remove harmful financial incentive. There is literally no point in putting money in biodiversity conservation if at the other end, you have a lot of money going into destroying biodiversity. Third one, I'd like to see some modification of the environmental legislation to really better support biodiversity conservation in times of rapid changes in climatic condition. And fourth, I'd like to get people to identify scientific, political and funding bodies that bring together the science of nature-based solution and really articulate priorities that integrate concerns on both climate change and biodiversity. Thank you to all our speakers who took part in today's episode. And of course, thank you to you, our listeners. If you enjoyed today's recording, don't forget to rate and review us on iTunes and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. You can find us on Twitter at ZSL Science and Facebook at ZSL Science and Conservation. As a charity, your support helps ZSL to care for the amazing animals in our zoos and protect wildlife around the world through our science and conservation work. If you're able to, you can donate on our website at www donate.zsl.org or join ZSL as a fellow to get closer to conservation and science. 